So what we'll do today is talk about trees and forests. If I can get the mouse to work properly. There we go. <clears throat> and um, this is this point in the semester where we're going to take a switch from thinking mainly about um, traditional analyses, correlation, regression, log regression, and move into more visualization statistics. Now these are not all visualization techniques. Like multidimensional scaling is mostly a visualization technique. Um, I think eventually we'll get to exploratory factor analysis, but this is more about how can we take the tools that create pictures of the data to help us understand what's going on. So we're going to kind of move away from p-values um, because their usefulness is only so much. Okay. Um, there are still some p-values today, but they're not used in the way that we normally use them to determine significance. All right, so conditional inference trees and random forests are really cool analysis, uh, and we're going to apply them to categories. So we're going to talk about what are categories and what are the use, why, why, why do we care as a person studying human language. And then later in the semester, we'll come back to this lecture actually and do a different analysis and apply it to categories. And uh, weirdly enough, that's what I was working on all day was a category ontology, giving labels to categories um, to thousands of features, which has made me and my computer cranky, apparently. So we'll talk a little bit about category structure. I'll kind of give you the background, the history of understanding categories, category theories, and then we will apply that, apply conditional inference trees to some of these topics. So getting started, um, we have to think about what is a category. Like, what is the purpose of category? Why do we have them? Okay. And it's a group or organization of related objects, things, ideas, etc. So we might say the category is dog, okay, or animal, and then there's a group of related objects that all fit under that category. Okay. Um, a concept is a category member. So if the category is animal, dog might be one. If the category is dog, we move down a descriptive level, the um, concept might be beagle, okay, which is the small dog sitting next to my feet being good for once today. Okay. Um, so if we we'll use animals, it could be dog, cat, bird, fish. If we use plants, it could be trees, flowers, etc. And most of the research done early in this kind of work was uh, looking at concrete noun related categories. So things that you could build a hierarchical structure out of. And so if you're familiar with WordNet, WordNet is a giant uh, dictionary that's built into this category concept structure. Um, and WordNet mostly is nouns and verbs. This gets a lot harder when we move into abstract categories, things that you can't touch. Uh, but it's still doable. And so humans use categories for lots of reasons. Um, as, as cognitive thinkers, we don't like to think that hard. So categories are a natural and easy way to do what's called satisficing, where it's just the quick and simplest answer. Um, this is why stereotypes are a thing. Um, and so <clears throat> categories are end up being very important for understanding uh, cognition, the, the way people think, and the way we study them is by thinking about the structure of language. And uh, to break categories into a hierarchical structure, um, which may be kind of represented by our conditional uh, inference trees, is that there tends to be a sort of superordinate. Um, it's more abstract, things like animals and mammals. Um, plants. Then there's basic level names which hold a special status in language. This is the level that we tend to talk at. Right? So we say, I have a dog, I have a cat. Okay. Uh, and then subordinate level names are more specific. Okay, so in, in WordNet this is all laid out quite nicely uh, because of the way that the hierarchical structure works. Sometimes these are called hypernyms and hyponyms. But it's really easy to call it superordinate, super meaning above, subordinate, like subscript, meaning below. And what we can see is there's different patterns of brain activation when hearing language for these different categories. So basic level names appear to occur all over the brain, meaning that they're kind of our like normal operating level. 
Subordinate level names tend to happen on the parietal and occipital lobe because they think that you're imagining what something looks like, a specific instance of, of one of those category names. Uh, at the superordinate level, it tends to be up here on the front and the uh, frontal lobe. Um, the cortex, this cortex has a name, it's like literally right here, and now I can't think of the name of it. Um, the anterior cingulate, that's what it's called, um, which is abstract reasoning areas. Okay. Um, so, oh, you're fine, no big deal. I was, it could be me as well, so. Not a problem. All right. So how do we form categories? So we think that, that language has a structure, and humans use this structure to, to kind of organize the world around us. So how do we how do they get formed? Okay. And that's partially of the interaction between language and the environment. These two things are cannot be separated. Um, so we think it's based on the way we sort of perceive the world. You can think about stereotypes because it's an easy instance of categories. Um, and the, um, the way that we perceive the world can uh, will, will influence environment and back and forth. So later we'll talk about the Sapir Whorf hypothesis, which is the one about there are more words for snow in Eskimos. That research has been sort of disproven, but the idea that that language and the environment cannot be separated is a pretty well-known uh, fact, which is useful for our purposes in analyzing language. Okay. So is it freezing? What is it doing for the people that can't hear, see, et cetera? I had to finish that train of thought or it would have rolled right out of the station and left me behind. Anyway. Nope, no comments? Anybody? Okay. It's like, I'm going to keep going if we don't have any, if it's not me. You can now, though. Yes. On my end, it shows that you can, that there is a voice, but obviously. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, okay, it's not me this time, because I, when I disconnected my thing, I do think it screwed up my end as well, but I think we're good now. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so, the purpose of, 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 of creating categories, I kind of talked about this already, is cognitive economy. We don't like to think that hard, so memory is organized for efficiency purposes. It also helps us avoid a lot of internal duplication, even though there is still a lot of that that goes on, um, it's useful if you have one category for dog, right? instead of a single bunch of categories for every type of dog. And there are, are a bunch of theories on how we learn categories, um, and so we'll kind of cover these because they cover different portions of different topics throughout the rest of the semester. But we've got featureless theory, <clears throat> we've got probabilistic theories, prototype and exemplar theories that go together into one set of theories, and then theory theories, which always makes me crazy to explain to people because they really they couldn't come up with a better name than theory theories. But the idea is that um, children develop theories about the way the world works, and they can categorize things based on those theories. Okay. So let's talk about a couple of these because they're really interesting. If you've never thought about how you know that a chair is a piece of furniture. Okay. Uh, featureless theory, this is some of uh, the research that I work on, not the specific theory, but the ideas behind it, is that our knowledge about the world is based on sort of a checklist of things that make up a concept. So if I am reading along in a, in a story about dogs, I have this little internal checklist of what makes it a dog. And you see people arguing about these things when they try to classify, let's say, movies or TV shows. Oh, this is sci-fi. This is fantasy. And like people argue a lot about how those are different things. Or you know, one has wizards and one has technology or something to that effect. Um, or 
you know, this is a thriller or whatever, crime drama. Um, the idea is that somehow we have these little checklists of what it has to have to make it be that thing. And um, this is the way that many classification models work, is that there's a sort of a yes, no checklist. And if it has all of those things, you'd say yes. And if it doesn't, you'd say no. And uh, after a little bit of work, it's clear that that's not totally true about the way language works um, and, con and humans, because we all know that an ostrich is a bird, even though it doesn't meet the real strong characteristics of birds, like flying. Right? It does have feathers, doesn't really have wings, and it definitely doesn't fly. So there's a clearly a, an ordered, ordered probability to what these features can be. So there are defining features, things that are absolutely required, like feathers. And then things that are just characteristic. Those are usually true, but not always, like flying. So then we know penguins are birds as well, but they, they don't fly. <clears throat> and so how do we test this theory? Like, how do people know that this is a thing, really? And um, the, the kind of interesting way to do this, there's lots of ways, but the sort of traditionally historic one is to um, use the sentence verification task. Right? And people literally just judge, oops, wrong button. Uh, oops, sorry, I thought I had it on the slide, I don't. Uh, if a sentence is true or false, so dogs have wings, you'd say false, or dogs have fur, you say true. And people take a lot of these and we look at the response latencies to those, um, those sentences and things that are characteristic features or things that are defining features are responded to more quickly. Things that are characteristic only are responded to a little bit slower. Sometimes this is called prototypicality. We'll get to that in a couple slides. So, oh, here it is. A dog is an animal. You would say yes to this, and yes pretty quickly. Um, and so at stage one, you are thinking about the overall feature similarity. Okay. Does dog meet my criteria for animal? Yes, it's living, it's breathing, it uh, is not human. Okay. If lots of these features overlap, the sentence response latency, that's what RL stands for, is quick. People are very fast at these tasks. If you don't really have any overlap, a dog is a fish, the sentence response latency is also fast when the answer is false. So defining and clearly not applicable features are very quick. It's that gray area in the middle uh, that gets that is interesting. These longer response latencies show us what's called fuzzy boundaries. So we believe that most categories have this sort of um, these sort of, I, I don't know another word for fuzzy boundaries, like uh, unclear gray areas at the ends where things can kind of bleed together. So wolves share a lot in common with dogs, but we know that they're different things. So that led, those theories kind of led to these probabilistic feature theories. And um, the idea was that, and this is what naive Bayes models are based on, is that there is a, a set of features that are more probable than others, and they're ranked hierarchically by their probabilities. And so these defining features are just more probable than the characteristic features. And when we go to determine if this new thing, fangled thing that we're seeing is it fits in our category, then we just kind of compare by most probable feature to least probable feature. So my funny story about that was the other day we were at a hardware store and this person walked in with this giant fluffy dog. And they had, like, feel, like this is like one of those like super giant golden doodle dogs. Right? And so like the size of a, like a mini horse. And they had its hair cut like a, like, like Pete Wentz, if you guys are familiar with Fall Out Boy, like Pete Wentz in the heyday of Fall Out Boy when he had the like super emo kid hair where it was all like brushed over one eye, right? Also guilty earlier in my life. Um, and so uh, I was in there going like, is that a dog with like an emo kid haircut? <laughs> like what is happening? 
And somebody was like, is that an alpaca? And I was like, it could be. It's so huge and fluffy. And so you could see people just like trying to figure out like what it was because of the way they had this poor dog's haircut, right? Um, and so that identification procedure, you had like the most common probable features down to the least. And so those are weighted by saliency, meaning how visible they are, how obvious they can be, and their, their likelihoods, their probabilities. And we could make um, the network models that you guys were making this last weekend, we could actually build network models based on these feature probabilities. So you'd have a word and its related features instead of a word and its collocates, like what we were doing. And you could show the weight of how much uh, two features went together. And so this is some of the work I did for my dissertation. Uh, and it was not as easy as it is now, unfortunately. <laughs> And so uh, some key issues with these two theories uh, is what makes something defining, right? Are the probabilities that we're seeing natural or are they salient? Because there's plenty of features that categories have that aren't ever listed. So if you ask people what makes a zebra a zebra, right? the first thing that comes up is horse, because it looks like a horse, and stripes, because zebras have stripes. People don't tend to mention that zebras have skin, they have hearts. Um, sometimes they'll mention that they have ears, right? they have hair. And so there are lots of features that people never list that are actually pretty much required. Um, so it's difficult to think about what is defining that might be culturally defined, or it might just be um, completely salient at the moment. It also doesn't deal with intercorrelated features. Oh, see, I wouldn't think about eating a zebra, but I suppose one could. Yes. Uh, the other thing that comes up a lot is that zebras are mean. And that's not a, a necessarily a defining feature either, but it's a very probable thing that people list because they're familiar with these sort of ideas that zebras are mean. Um, because <clears throat> you can't pet them at the zoo because they bite. So. Intercorrelated features, these relationships between features. So things that have skin tend to have fur. Those two things are highly related because of biology. So how do we capture that relationship? And then the other issue that, um, this is the paper I've actually literally been working on all day, is this idea of procedural invariance. How do we ask participants or how do we uh, computationally model these sorts of things, these sorts of category language interconnectedness, when asking participants the same question in two different ways gives you two different answers. Okay. And so procedural invariance is what should be happening, where it doesn't matter what procedure we use, we get the same answer, but it is clear that the procedure that we use will give us different answers. Now they're highly related, but we would like to all get, you know, have our work replicate. Um, so we're writing a primer on how one processes this sort of data uh, so that it is reproducible. And uh, it sucks. Lots of regular expressions. And so if you ask people, is Robin a bird? Most people say yes. And if you say, is a bird a Robin? Um, which isn't quite the same question. Um, people will hesitate for a lot longer. Uh, but even then, if you say, well, what makes, what is a Robin? Um, versus what kind of birds are there, you don't see robin come up as much as you might expect. And so that led, those problems led into what are called family resemblance models. And this is really where we're going to work. Um, but I think it helps to understand where people are coming from. Um, and so uh, uh, we'll come back to featureless theory later. Well, family resemblance models break into two types. There's prototype theory and there's exemplar theory. Okay? And they're both right. So fast forward preview, who's right here, they will always be arguing about which one is more right because we think they're probably both correct. You're just used in different instances. 
So prototypes are an abstraction. So if I asked you what makes a dog a dog, you're going to imagine um, an average or an abstraction of all these different dogs that you've seen in your life. Okay. Um, and so if you ask people about cars, about categories that are really large, that have lots of examples, this is what tends to happen, is they kind of take all those examples and kind of average them together. And um, so they're a combination of experienced examples and the, the actual, I don't want to use the word image because it doesn't have to be an image, the actual sort of brain activation for this may not be anything that exists in the real world versus exemplar theory where it's a specific stored example that you compare whatever you're seeing in the, the world to. Okay. So when it came to giant golden doodles with bad haircuts <laughs> the other day, uh, my friend had a golden doodle. So I was like, oh, it looks like my friend's dog, but what happened to its hair? <laughs> right? um, and this is when you see a car you don't recognize. Like, well, that kind of looks like this car. Uh, so uh, exemplar theory is better for categories that are smaller. So things that have less um, possible looks to them. And so we do both. And the idea is that there's this inst... I hate, I hate this word. <laughs> Instantiation. Instantiation is how, how it's pronounced. But it just every time I see that word, it gives me like small trimmers, right? So it's the idea that uh, categories are essentially a set of little mini pictures about the range of possible instances that could be included in them. Um, and so this is why you see children who have maybe never seen a horse before call a horse a cow. Because maybe they've seen cows and know the cows are big and they have four legs and they're in the field and that thing is big and it has four legs and it's in the field. And so it matches that instance close enough. And so they say cow, and you're like, ha ha, that's so cute. And you tell them, oh no, it's a horse. And so they take that instance, that picture, and separate it into a separate category. And so now we have all the different times that I have seen horses, and so I know they're different than cows. And so the ideas behind these theories, and these two theories really came from different research labs, because um, trying to answer the same question and then for a long time in cognitive research it was who was right who was right who was right and now we're like fine they're both right when are they right okay. so finding all the the different ways that these two theories kind of work um, because they're very similar in their conceptual arguments um, the core of it is that it's either a prototype an abstract concept or it's an exam a specific example Excuse me. All right. So the way that we separate things into categories is by comparing them to some sort of exemplar or prototype. And um, what this has led to is really interesting work on what's called schemas. So schemas are more like categories for doing things. So it's a way to organize knowledge. And um, the the like your example, your schema for restaurants. So you have a friend that says, hey, you're coming to Boston to watch my dogs, which is what I'm doing. Yay, puppies. Um, <clears throat> and which has like nothing, I always talk about dogs in this lecture. It's not on purpose, the dog conversation today. Um, anyways, so uh, let's say I have a friend. She's like, hey, we're going to go try this restaurant. And I'm like packing my clothes for tomorrow. And I'm like, is this like a sit down nice restaurant? Is this fast food? Is this a bar? Cause I'm trying to figure out what clothes to bring. Okay. The features of, of the restaurant are the schema filler. So the category here is the type of restaurant. And then there's a schema that goes with that, the rules that, that follow. Okay. She told me, oh yeah, it's a bar. I'm like, okay, I can wear my jeans and t-shirt. I don't need anything fancy. Okay. So we are filling in um, the features based on what we expect to happen. And then when we look at the same research, these sense verification tasks, if things are prototypical, not just their features, but if the category member is, a, is sort of like the, uh, the best category member, it's faster. 
So we can see which representations match the category best by looking at how fast people respond to them. And um, a lot of this is mainly like it shows the same rules as feature list theory. The idea is that instead of checking off features, instead we're comparing to a picture. Um, does this look like this? Holding them up next to each other. And the features come in as like a filler um, for helping us understand the way things should be or should be going. The last set of theories is called theory theories. Um, and we'll get more into these um, and semanticity over the next couple of weeks because after this we have, I wrote it down, profile analysis and LSA, which are heavily based on these ideas of of words that are related to each other, um, carry the same company, and so they end up rising from these categories. And so in a theory theory, it's uh, there are little miniature theories about the way the world should work and how things are related to other things, and so um, we use those to group objects together. And it's sort of like a dictionary except that they are um, kind of like mini hypotheses about the world. So uh, children appear to do this sort of thing, adults not so much because our dictionary knowledge is a little bit more solidified. But let's say, oh, like a hockey fever right now, right? So I'm like, I don't know, like four facts about hockey um, that I think that is soccer on ice which to me means it's like, is it football season yet, right? Um, and so my theory about hockey is that it's soccer on ice, right? and that would help me understand what you're supposed to do and when you're supposed to cheer, right? Um, and so uh, theory theories are really useful. Are people, we think that people use them when it's totally new. Okay? It's an unexperienced event. And so you are trying to relate it to something you are familiar with so you can kind of have an expectation of what should happen. So from that, we have many ways that we can approach uh, linguistic knowledge. So people can have, we can have these feature theories, so we can make network models, kind of relating it back to what we did this weekend. Uh, we can make network models of the words and their features, which is what some people have done. We could, um, which we'll cover later, um, we could make um, exemplars, find the, the middle mode, which is the most uh, prototypical or exemplar member and see how everybody's related to that. So we can actually work on these like different levels. And to me, that's the most interesting thing about doing this kind of research is that I can narrow down onto what makes a, a thing a thing, right? And what words do we expect to have um, in text as definers? Or I can work on how is this concept related to that concept? Maybe it's through these features, or maybe it's through these prototypes. All right, how do I relate that to statistics though? So I've already told you you could do this with network analysis. Um, so what we're gonna to do today is called conditional inference trees. Okay. So conditional inference trees are a type of regression. They're not totally, <coughs> excuse me, they're not totally regression, it's kind of, Regression on steroids, I suppose. Um, that's actually what factor analysis is. But it's kind of like if I took regression and classification, I'm going to merge them together. So it's kind of like log regression in a sense. Um, and so what you do is you have data with lots of variables, and you find the variable that's the most predictive. Okay. So we're going to assess the association of N or multiple IVs with the DV and you pick the one with the largest predictive ability. Then you split the data into twos. Normally, um, this is a binary classification um, based on where that predictiveness is, so the logit. Or if it's a category, this is really easy, split by category. Um, and then look for the next best prediction in the data and split on that. So what is happening is you're taking the data and slowly splitting it into these little subsets. So this kind of analysis is best used when you expect there to be lots of interactions 
in the data. Excuse me. I always have to eat before y'all's class because I have a what, class right after this. <clears throat> and whew, I've either had too much soda and coffee today or um, y'all you know, got the burps from dinner or something. So, excuse me. <clears throat> I definitely had too much coffee today, but that's a different story. So we're splitting the data. Um, and so if the data is categorical, it's split along those categories. If it's continuous, this might be a median split. It might be 25, 75. It'll show you the best place for the split. Okay. Median splits always make me nervous, but these analyses are really useful at helping us understand interactions. So I get this question a lot. When I use this over log regression per se, um, and that's when you expect there to be lots of interactions because you can figure those out without having to test a log regression with 35 interactions. Uh, and then you continue creating the tree, the branches of the tree, until there's nothing left. So this is also really handy when you have lots and lots of variables and you're trying to figure out which ones are the most useful. Uh, sometimes people suggest a stepwise regression. This actually works a little better than that. As long as there are interactions in the data. If there are not interactions in the data, then this is not a very good analysis. And it's considered a tree because we are starting at the roots where everything is, um, where there's just one relationship and we're slowly building out the branches. And the very end is called a, the leaf. So some advantages here. Um, as compared to uh, other recursive partitioning uh, types, this particular one that we're going to talk about doing today, a conditional inference forest tree and then a random forest, um, tends to have less uh, variable selection bias. And so other types of recursive partitioning, so this is technically a recursive partitioning pattern, um, can be biased in the sense that it looks at the data and says, oh, I can split this data set, this variable the most. Here, we're going to pick the variable that has the most association or the best variable and not necessarily the one that it can actually partition the most. Um, we don't tend to need to prune the tree, meaning that it breaks down into too many, um, too many branches. Um, and it does actually show you the p-values for the splits. We don't tend to use these quite as much as we would use the p-values in, a, say, a normal regression. It is a permutation pr um, procedure, and so... Um, do understand that normal p-values are based on the, the, the assumption of a distribution, usually a normal distribution, and it tells me if um, the null is true, then here's the likelihood of getting this test statistic in whatever way it's testing. Right? Um, here, the p-value is interpreted as here is the likelihood of getting this result given a scrambled set of this data running over and over again. So the interpretation here is wildly different. Um, and so what happens is the, the as part of permutation, you rearrange the data, you scramble it, you calculate your statistic, and then you count how many times your effect is present um, given this rearranged data. Okay. So you want those p-values to be small still because uh, if you get the same effect and uh, when the data is scrambled, that implies that there, <laughs> it's, there's, it's just chance. Okay. If you only see your effect when it's your real data, that implies that the effect is truly there and it's not chance. So the big thing here is to um, be sure you understand that this is not the probability of if the null is true, here's the likelihood of finding this result or more extreme. This is how likely is this effect compared to a random set of runs on this data. That is different from bootstrapping because bootstrapping uh, randomly samples from your data set and you hope to get the same effect. Permutation statistics scramble your data and you hope to not see the same effect because then that means that your effect is basically a scrambled data set. 
So these are easy to get kind of confused, but remember bootstrapping is when we're testing on similar samples, what we hope are similar samples taken from our own data. Permutation is all the different ways the data could be combined and see how many times you still get the effect that you had. Okay, let's build a random forest. Okay. What a random forest does is it shows me the importance of each variable. And so it runs a bunch of trees and then um, shows me the influence of each variable on the tree. Generally, these trees are the same every single time. It is a permutation test, though, so it can be different. But generally, uh, the forest is the same as the trees. I think it's called a forest because we're building a lot of trees. It's a cute naming. Um, it kind of also matches that category idea, right? Random forests are made of lots of trees. Um, that's unintentional. <laughs> uh, and what they show me is kind of like a partial variance statistic, like which variable was the most important averaged over all of these. Generally, that's the one at the top of the tree or the roots of the tree, if you will. Um, but if two variables are very close in their importance, one of them gets to be the first branch and then the other one gets to be the second branch. And they might actually flip back and forth, but it'll tell you that the first branch and the second branch are pretty equal in their usefulness, or it might be that the first branch is like way outweighing everything else. So this is really nice because it shows me kind of how many branches are heavily weighted, weighted versus branches that maybe aren't as strong. <clears throat> These are also super useful when the data is sparse. Okay, sparse data means there's lots of zeros. So lots of times when there aren't um, every possible combination of different data points, and especially when the data is non-parametric, meaning there are a lot of categories. And so the assumptions are pretty minimal, right? We're not doing normal uh, null hypothesis testing. We're doing permutation p-values. P and so we don't really have an assumption of a distribution because the p-value is how many times did we find this effect after we scrambled the data? There is no null there. So we don't have to have some sort of underlying probability distribution. We're essentially creating it ourselves. And this is why I think permutation tests are the shiznit. They're awesome because they don't require me to assume something like if the null is true, which, you know, if you remember back to your earlier classes, um, you should be suspicious of because how often is it actually true? All right, so um, a package you should have, but if you don't, you should install party. <laughs> so we're going to make conditional inference trees with, with party, which uh, makes me laugh every time we get here. Um, and uh, obviously the Arling package for the data. <clears throat> and then... Um, the data set itself is uh, sets of categories. And we're going to kind of work with those causative, that was this class, right? Causative constructions. Yes, because for log, log regression, we talked about uh, do versus let, right? So we're going to do kind of the same thing, but in English this time. So make, have, and cause. Uh, and we're going to try to predict which one is happening. So now we're moving into the realm of we have multiple instances that we're predicting. We're not just predicting two. From there, we're going to work with a couple of IVs, um, things that hopefully are familiar from last week. Um, the semanticity of the actor, okay, the person doing the action. So are they animate? Humans are animate. Inanimate? Rocks are inanimate. Okay. The semanticity of the person being acted upon, the actee. Um, are they animate or inanimate? The semanticity of the event. Is it mental, thinking, physical, or social? And these are all nice uh, features that you might expect. So essentially we're trying to figure out which features go with the word make and which features go with the word have. So we're trying to see what distinguishes these categories. Or in another scenario, we might be looking at what predicts which one people use. Well, which one people use is based on what category they assume these words fit into. So these things are all related. Um, are they, is it part of an indication? Have not, um, not cause, that kind of thing. And then is it a co-reference, meaning 
you did the thing to you, so I made myself lunch, okay. versus uh, you did the thing to the other. So are the actee and the actor the same person or not? Uh, and then, oh, there's one more. Possessiveness. Is it possessive, yes or no? Um, <clears throat> so the data set is cause. And then I just subsetted out um, a couple of them because the cause data set actually has um, a couple of other uh, examples in it. But we're just going to look at make, have, and cause. So I use drop levels here to just ignore the rest. Okay, so I only wanted to be able to predict these three. Generally, the analyses will ignore empty levels. Sometimes they don't, though. So this drop levels thing is really handy in making sure that we are not trying to predict an empty category that we weren't trying to use anyway. OK. Um, we're going to start with a random number generator, just like with the network models. Um, this just helps kind of get, grease the wheels. <laughs> So it sets a, a random seed to start. So you can change yours. You should get approximately the same answer. Sometimes, though, if we run with different random numbers, what will happen is variables that are very similar in the prediction will flip back and forth. And by creating a random forest, we can tell that they're the same level of predictiveness. So it doesn't really matter which one goes first. And then we're going to make a tree. So C tree for conditional inference tree. And then this. Um, code is just like LM, just like logistic regression. Okay. Y is predicted by, and then just add them all together. Okay. Don't add any multiplying because it's doing that kind of internally. Um, and then you just kind of essentially toss them all in and see what happens. And then tell it what the data set is. Okay. So we've got all that saved as tree.output. Let's see what's in that. We can say plot that bad boy. So here's how you read one of these. These are really great. So we start here at the top, and it's got them numbered, so you can tell um, what order they went in. So the first branch that happened is the semanticity CR of the, oh, now I got back up. I've forgotten. That's actor, I think. Yes. Semanticity of the actor, the person doing the having or making. And that, so it gives us a permutation p value. So the likelihood of seeing this split in a random subset of the data is very small. Okay. Not a random subset, a random run of the data is very small. And so that's split on its two categories, inanimate and animate. Okay. If you had a continuous variable here, it would tell you at what, like, a, a quantile, quartile, how, how, where it split the data. The next split happened over here on the inanimate side. So that literally takes the inanimate data and splits it off. So looking at the inanimate data only, the um, semanticity of the event is the second most important um, predictor, okay, only for inanimate data. And it split that as mental on one side and physical and social on the other. Okay, so for inanimate actors, rocks, okay, a mental action and a physical and a social action are different things. Maybe rock is not the best example. I mean, inanimate things are like tables, right? So it's weird to have a mental actor on a table, okay, but um, maybe it's, no, the because oh, it's an inanimate actor. Hmm. So however this tends to break down, for some, some reason rocks are thinking, right? Um, from there, what it, the branching stops. Okay, so no other variable is useful. So our possessiveness, our negations, none of that was, was helpful in predicting each category. From here, what we see is for inanimate actors in a mental event, which I cannot think of an example at the moment, what you're going to see is which category is best. Now, I can't read this currently, so it might be better if we blow this up. Make it a bit bigger. Let's hit this button, then that button. And since we are doing some a permutation test, these are slower, depending on how fancy your computer is. Generally, it isn't this slow. 
my tree has run. There we go. The markdown does not like me today. There we go. So if I make it bigger, you can see this a little better. And then we can, since this is a plot, you can play with the, the size of the print to make this a little easier to read. But what we see is cause to V is out here. This middle one is have, and the outside one is make. So I think you can play with CEX. Let's see if that does what I think it does. Okay. Well, it made some of the text smaller, but not all of it. Okay, so we'd have to kind of uh, use the plot, the normal plot rules to figure out how to see this. Okay, I might not be doing anything useful here. I thought it was CEX. Anyway, um, what you see here is the probability of each of these categories or each of these predictive predicted outcomes um, based on this split. So for inanimate mental actors, it's make. Okay. Um, oh, so the table made a nice sitting place. It's not thinking, hmm. but something like that. Um, it's going to be make. So make is a scenario where there's inanimate actors doing some sort of mental event. Okay. Um, for inanimate actors in a physical and social event, it's going to be cause. Okay. And so we can see that there's a pretty clear like distinction here where make is this set of options and cause is this other set of features. We look on the other side of the branch for animate actors. And the next most important split was still the um, semanticity of the event. It doesn't have to be. This could be a different variable. Um, but that one came next. And then um, <clears throat> for both of them. Uh, here we've got mental and physical uh, stuck together. And this makes sense because animate actors have thinking and acting. And then they have social events. So it makes sense that these two things, sides are a little different. But if it's an animate actor in a mental or physical event, it's pretty much all three. Okay? So it's an equal likelihood of seeing each of the categories. So each of these categories has this option. And this is where fuzzy boundaries come into play, where these are the ways that the categories are related to each other because they all have the same features. However, for social events, it breaks down one more time into the semanticity of the actee. So an animate actor in a social event on an inanimate object. This one's easy. I petted the dog, right? Or I have, I made the dog bark, right? Um, oh, inanimate actor. Dogs are mental. Hmm. I made the table, the kitchen table for dinner, right? Um, what we see is that it's going to be make or have. Have is the middle one here. And it's most definitely have out here for animate actors in a social event working with animate things. Um, and so what this shows me is the scenarios or the category requirements for each of these verbs. And I can tell when they're most likely. So make is most likely scenarios inanimacy that's mental. Cause is most likely scenarios inanimacy that's physical or social. Have over here is animate in a social event with an animate actor and they're all three pretty likely in this particular scenario and so it's essentially showing us where the data is for each interaction okay, and their interactions because it's animate in this particular scenario meaning both of those are required all right all right we went through all this but a quick recap. Okay, the tree includes all possible splits at p less than 0.05, or else permutation p. The ovals are the names of the variables, and the splits are considered the branches. Hello, hello, markdown, gonna work with me today. And the bottom piece, um, since I tend to get asked this about the homework, is is the probability of each of those events in that particular branch. All right, so we kind of went through all this already. Oops, sorry. So.
So make is a featurely comprised of mental inanimate events. Cause is featurely comprised of physical or social inanimate events. And then this really is for you later if you forget what we've gone over, but what we see is a different split for animate actors. Each verb is equal when it comes to animate mental and physical events. And then in social events, what we see um, is a little bit of make, but a whole lot of have. And so I could create this sort of feature checklist for these verbs. Here's when this verb is going to happen. And this is sort of like a nice, to me, these are a little easier to interpret than log regression sometimes. Okay. So I don't have to think about like the log odds of different things. I'm going to be like, here is the times that have occurs, and here's the time that make occurs. So how good is our model? Excuse me. Okay. So what I want to do in a similar style to log regression is predict how good I am at guessing the right category based on each um, split. So this is sort of like <clears throat> predicting the probability of the actual outcome. So to do that, what we do is we use predict and then our tree that we've saved. I'm going to compare that directly to the table of the actual data. And the diagonal here is when I get it right. So I predicted cause and it is cause. Predicted have and it is have. Predicted make and it is make. It's also considered a confusion matrix, if you're familiar with those, where you can see where we're getting it wrong. And so have, we're getting a little bit wrong by guessing cause and a little bit wrong because we're guessing make. Everything else is pretty, good, pretty accurate. You're never 100% accurate. And we can sum. Um, the diagonal, so sum up the diagonal, divide it, and that's the ones we're getting right, and um, divide that by the total, and this is getting 67% of the category um, prediction correct. When you have three options, 33% is chance, so we're doing double chance, which is pretty good. And I would say that every, anything I'm missing is half. Half is a sort of uh, one that we're getting the most wrong. It, but have is also the largest category. And that's because have is also an auxiliary verb that can um, be paired with other verbs, like have gone, that sort of thing. And so now I want to know, um, so I've, to I've told you I have this tree, and we know that these things are predictive, and I'm doing a little bit better than chance. I mean, I'm doing twice chance, but which variable is the most important? It shows me the nodes, one, two, three, four, five, but are they all equally important on the second level, or is one of them more useful than the other? And then really this question answers, are one and two flippable? Uh, so we're going to make now C forest instead of C tree, and then you run the same basic code here. Except we are going to run a, a big forest from the book, Grow a Big Forest here. And this is the number of trees to run, which is 1,000, and the number of variable pairs to try at the start. And so this one actually works a little differently in that it um, picks pairs of variables as like um, <laughs> competitors in a race and picks whichever one is better first. So it can tell about the, it can tell how, um, sort of how much of variance each one accounts for as opposed to just making all the trees and getting the same tree a thousand times, it kind of like starts the tree in different places to see which ones are the most predictive. And two seems to be a good option. Um, if you have, you know, hundreds of variables, you might want to start with a bigger number. But two is the suggested start point. And then once you run your forest, okay, we're just going to say that as forest.output. You can also plot this, which we'll do here in a second. And so remember, forest is a lot of these trees. This is the part that runs pretty slow. Um, you can save the variable importance. Okay, so var imp here is for variable importance. You can treat these as partial correlations. You put in your forest. Make sure you're putting your forest, not your tree. And we're going to make them conditional on each other. Okay. 
So that just allows us to see, you know, controlling for all of the other variables, how important is each of the original variables, which is similar to the way PR squared works. And then I just printed them out, rounded them so I can see it a little better. And what I'm seeing here is that the semanticity of the actor, actor is about 10%, but check these two out are very similar. So the semanticity of the event and the semanticity of the actee actually are very close in their predictiveness. So even though, back up to our picture here, even though um, the semanticity of the uh, act E only came up on this side, the variables overall are e pretty equally predictive. And you wouldn't have guessed that by looking at this plot because it looks like the semanticity of the event is way more important because it comes up on both sides. But it turns out that over here, this is really handy. So they're actually equally predictive across the whole model. So that's really what the purpose of a forest is to tell you which variables are kind of a rank of their prediction predictiveness. While a tree tells me the picture of the data, like which ones split where, the features involved in each category. Um, this one tells me the, the usefulness of each uh, variable overall. You can also make a cute dot chart. I don't know that I find this like particularly compelling, but it was in the book and I thought it was kind of fun. But I can go make a dot chart and you're plotting the predictiveness. So in case you don't you like visualizations more than you like raw numbers, I can tell that these two are pretty equal and this is ten times or twice as much, a little over twice. Um, and these are all basically nothing. Okay, they don't chum, they don't come up on the chart at all, and they're basically not very useful in their predictiveness. Now, how good is the forest at predicting? Okay. Now, you want your tree and your forest to give you the same basic level of predictiveness. Okay. When you grow lots of trees, your forest is generally a bit more, a bit better at predicting. So you have to understand that the forest does not have the same, uh, quite the same picture. It's an average of all the trees. And since we have these different start points uh, on purpose, what we can see is that we might get them a little bit better if we ran this model with lots of permutations. And it's just a bit better. You really don't, what you don't want to have happen is that your tree is uh, one like very different than your forest. Okay? That implies that there's something kind of wacky about the data. Underlying this data, there is a combination that is particularly odd um, and it's capitalizing on that chance. And so you'd have to go through and figure out what that was. But we see here we're getting actually a little better at have. And now when we get have wrong, it's generally by guessing make. Okay. And so that's the, the, the right side branches of the forest uh, of the tree. And so we see that have kind of generate and kind of that gravitates to more towards make in a forest, okay. averaging over lots of models. And we're still get, but we're getting pretty close. It was 67% before, it's 71% now. That's pretty close. All right, so in summary, um, I went faster than I expected. Um, what we can see is that we can really start to think about this idea of creating these categories. Now, how this is useful other than this kind of idea of like how do people work, right? It might be for keyword analysis. So we'll talk about this a lot about the idea of understanding keywords, right? So that's how people find things on the internet. So if you're working for a business that's like, I need the right hashtag, right? Or um, I need the right keywords on these products so people find them on Amazon. Uh, and then I think in my other class, we've talked about Wish a couple of times. I don't think we've, we, this class has talked about Wish. Um, but there's a similar website. I, don't, I think you have to have an account to log in. Um, but Wish is a website uh, that has lots of very cheap products and there's this really great YouTuber that I follow that just like buys like categories of objects on Wish and um, talks about whether or not they were crap or not. <laughs> and so 
um, what you'll see on the listings for these products is that they have these just like gigantically long names um, because what they're trying to do is game the search engine um, optimization and use as many keywords as humanly possible to so they come up with lots of many different um, searches right you see this some on Amazon too especially be suspicious of Amazon titles that are very long so I think there's some good ones for TV mounts I remember thinking this when I was buying my TV mount um, so these kind of like very very long titles now this one's pretty good because it is um, more describing all of the scenarios that it works in and they're not really random but what you see sometimes with very long uh, names here is that people are trying to like sort of be where they always pop up when someone's searching for this um, and so this is a good example of these moments where they just have so many keywords on here right um, some other things that you can kind of look at let's just click on one of these um, it, on Amazon that uh, that they use some of this stuff to detect fraud now I'm not saying that this one is fraudulent this actually looks pretty legit but if you go down and look oh my god if I can get to the bottom here and you look at the reviews what you can see what was I buying the other day oh I remember yeah yeah, yeah. this is a great example of how these analyses can be useful uh, so as part of our ninjutsu as part of our um, uh, buying this house that I will one day have unpacked um the mortgage company gave us a free gift and one of our free gifts our free gift was this uh, pressure cooker air fryer which i love the heck out of um i have thought before like oh instant pots like those people just don't know how to cook no they know what's going on this thing is awesome <laughs> um so i was trying to find a cookbook for it and um it's kind of amazing what goes on in in amazon sometimes because uh, some of these cookbook things, right? So if you look at these uh, cookbook options, I was trying to find something that had more than like four reviews. And this is not loading because my internet's crapping out. But what you can look for and that we could do with these sorts of analyses is figure out um, what the words are that people are using when they write reviews because what you see sometimes on websites like Amazon is that they have a fake review problem. So everybody's using, they're cutting and pasting reviews. So they're getting paid to put these reviews on here so people's uh, uh, products come up higher. And so we could, we could show that one um, particular label for a keyword comes up way too often. Like it's too predictive, like it's a perfect predictor. I talked about those last week. Or um, we could show that the category topics appear to change, and so there was something I don't I don't know what my what I did to break Amazon here, but there was uh, when I was looking at these, it was clear that a lot of these were like um, uh, somewhat fake, and then the uh, something else I was looking at one day, it was clear that they had. Um, the people had bought a listing. So one of the other issues that's kind of going on is that people will buy listings with lots of reviews and um, change them to something else. Oh, I wish I could remember what it was because it was really fun. Um, but it was like I was looking for something and then the reviews were all about handbags and that's not what I was buying. And so it was clear that they had switched to the product at some point but had the same link. And so it still had all of the reviews on it. So it looks like it's a really popular object because it has a lot of reviews, but it actually was not. Um, so we could use this sort of analysis to predict um, predict what what is in these categories, and maybe I can use that to help me uh, flag five flag fraudulent postings. Um, so. I'd say that the, the, the largest use for a lot of this on like researcher sides is figuring out, you know, what kind of what are the category listings, but I can apply that to a business scenario on what is the most useful set of keywords 
or or detecting fraud or hate speech so you know twitter right now has a big hate speech problem uh, youtube is also fighting a lot of this sort of stuff so finding the best way to predict those moments is uh, important so all right that's the purpose of some of this um, and so we can use our conditional inference trees, our forest, to see what the exemplar is. What is the most predictive point? So if I, if I know all of these are considered hate speech, what is the most useful object that I can have to denote these, to flag them? Um, and this is especially handy in scenarios with sparse data, which most uh, text like reviews or Twitter is going to be very sparse, meaning you won't have every combination of every possible variable. And there might be a lot of interactions, which is definitely true of these, these events. And so this kind of analysis would allow me to take a lot of variables and reduce it down to only the most important ones. The bad thing about them is that they run slowly sometimes. 